Day 42, the barbarian invasions. Now the word barbarian simply means not Roman. And these different barbarian groups were different in a lot of respects, but to the Romans, they put them under one umbrella, barbarians. Now, I think a parallel we see in American history is that the Native American tribes are lumped together Indians. And I think even among educated people, if you were to ask them the difference between a Chippewa or a Sioux or a Cherokee, I don't think a lot of Americans know that. It's kind of lumped together under this big umbrella Indian. And the barbarians were one of the main reasons Rome fell. And the date Rome fell is 476 AD. And I think this painting shows, you know, what you need to see. So after about a thousand years, the Roman Empire finally falls. So who were the barbarians? These people who were, um, I want to say, entirely responsible for Rome's fall, but they were a big reason for Rome's fall. Like I said before, any group that was not Roman. And these were the groups of people that were living in Europe that weren't part of the Roman Empire. And yes, I noticed these people are naked, but their fighting style was, especially to a Roman, very primitive, where they would show up on the battlefield with very little clothing, if any, and with wooden weapons, very undisciplined fighting style, and it was a real stark contrast to the Romans, culturally and in, in, in every way. And the history of the of uh, the barbarian people to Rome was not a positive one. I, you know, I, I liken it to kind of a thorn in the side. They were just kind of irritants, and they, you know, they were so different from Rome, and they wouldn't join Rome, and they didn't have that order and structure that the Romans prided themselves on. So it was not a, a, a friendly history. It was the barbarians struck me as an irritant to the Romans more than anything. And you can see there's a lot of variety between these barbarian groups. Now, if you come from European descent, you can see the various groups of people that were there in the modern countries. So, for example, I see the anglo saxon the Angles, Angles land, England. I see the Franks. Franks sounds a lot like France, okay? Even the Lombards, the northern part of Italy to this day is still called Lombardy. And you can see that, you know, um, a lot of different barbarian tribes existed and were migrating into Rome, migrating into Rome, because again, Rome had stuff that they wanted. It was a, a place that had wealth, and they were attracted to that. Now, the culture, if you put it as Germanic culture, was a very warring, fighting culture. They, there was a lot of infighting among themselves. That's how they learned to fight. Now, to make a living, these were hunters and farmers, subsistence living for all intents and purposes. Now, to their religion, it was, it was fighting. To get to heaven, to warrior's heaven was Valhalla, and they had animal and human sacrifices. Some of them were very tor torturous and very gross and very violent, um, but that was their culture. Now, eventually, um, Christianity did set in among these people, which caused an assimilation. But prior to their Christian conversion, their practices, there's, we wouldn't recognize them in modern times. Uh, one of the legacies they did leave behind are the days of the week. So you know, Sunday is the day for the sun. Moon day became Monday. Two, the Germanic god two, Tuesday. Tuesday, Woden. Woden's day became Wednesday. Thor's day became Thursday. Fr Frigg, which was uh, Woden's wife, was Frigg's day, was Friday. And then we have a vestige of the Romans with Saturn. So, you know, it's fairly trivial, but how did we get the days of our weeks from these Germanic people? Now, in terms of Germanic justice, they had a very different way of doing things. They would put people through trials, and if you survived the trial, you were innocent. If you were injured or killed by the trial, you were guilty. And a lot of times if there was a dispute, it wasn't uh, Judge Judy here. It was, you know, pick up a weapon and, let, and let's go. So it was a very warring, violent culture. Uh, of these people. And there were several of them. Again, I want to make this point here that if you look at the United Kingdom and the British Isles, a lot of Americans don't know this, the Big Island to the north is Scotland. Now, the Picts were a distinct people from the other groups. To this day, Scotland is distinct from 
the other parts of the island. The large part of the island became the Anglos and Saxons, Angles land, England, Anglo-Saxon became, you know, the English part, the largest part of the island. Then the western part with the Britons is modern day uh, Wales. So if you are Scottish, Welsh, English, these are, you know, your uh, predecessors. These are your ancestors. Now to the west, it didn't appear on this map, Ireland is a sovereign nation and the Celts resided in Ireland and the Jutes the modern Danes. And you can see um, these are the ancestors of modern Europeans. So we took a pause and we talked about our favorite story, which we probably could have used after a PowerPoint lecture. And I loved hearing the stories. <clears throat> Some people uh, chose scripture. Some people chose movies. Some people chose books. Some people had family stories. Some people had funny stories from middle school and teachers that, you know, split their pants and all that kind of thing. And it was fun. You know, that was a fun part of class, sharing stories and explaining why your story is such a good story. And the reason why we stopped this is maybe the biggest contribution from these Germanic people, not the days of the week per se, was a book. And it's a book called Beowulf. Now, Beowulf is the oldest known text in the English language. And within the book of Beowulf, they were, there were ten archetypes. And archetypes are big ideas that apply to many things. And these are the ten archetypes. And if you look at any modern movie, modern book, your favorite story, I'm not saying it has all ten. I think Star Wars has all ten. But most don't have all ten, but they have... A few of these. So this notion of good versus evil. What is good? What is evil? A lot of stories have that. Forging a self-identity. My favorite movie is called The Truman Show, and that's exactly what that archetype is. Finding out who you are. I would argue that's what high school is all about. Strength and skill. Stories of strength and skills. A lot of sports stories. I love hearing stories about the 89, 90 bad boys basketball team of all their skill and how they defeated everybody. Those are cool stories. Rags to, to riches. Getting money. Getting wealthy. Lots of stories have that. Uh, religious beliefs, stories of religiosity, obviously very important to some people. Violence. People dig violence. They like violence in their art. They like violence in their stories. And Beowulf is a violent story, and that violence is still with us. Uh, demonstrating courage, you know, overcoming fear. This is a very common archetype in many different books. Death and mortality, this notion that we only have X amount of years, you better live them right and you know if you can really key in on the fact that we are going to die you might live better and that was an archetype in Beowulf supernatural forces there's books about you know phantoms and ghosts and paranormal activity and poltergeist and all that kind of stuff again there was that in Beowulf and then tradition a lot of books are there to maintain tradition Christmas is coming up there are traditional Christmas stories that have been read for generations this is another archetype. So I'm going to argue the Germanic people, people's biggest contribution is this book, Beowulf. And there are many different groups. Vandals, in fact, the crime of vandalism still come from these people because these people would just come in and mess things up badly. And if you are a vandal, you go someplace and you mess things up badly. So the vandals were another group. The Franks, the Franks became the, uh, the French and, you know, they had a reason to fight. I mean, it, their kingdom in Gaul was really um, mistreated by the Romans for a lot of centuries. So, you know, if you mistreat a group of people long enough, they will rise up. And the Franks are another example of that. The Huns. Now, in terms of the Huns, a lot of you got your exposure to the Huns from Mulan, those big, scary, shirtless guys with yellow eyes. But Attila the Hun was a bad man. He took out huge just uh, portions of Europe and he was unstoppable he was like a knife going through warm butter and cruel the Huns were known for their cruelty and their violence you know here's a quote that sums him up there where I have passed the grass will never grow again <laughs> and that sums up Attila the Hun by the way fast forward in history to the American Civil War and General Sherman burning out the south very reminiscent of Attila the Hun sort of techniques. And you can see just wherever he'd go, boom, 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 boom. Some people to a certain point just said, here, take all our money. Just leave it here. Have it already. We can't even fight you. So the Huns were maybe the most feared of all the barbarian groups. And the Visigoths, and there was the Ostrogoths, and there was a lot of variety within these barbarian groups. And you can see when Rome fell, that void was filled in by these barbarian groups to one portion of the empire. Now, the other portion of the empire becomes the Byzantines, 
and that's for tomorrow's class. So to sum up, the barbarians were the group of European people, and a lot of them came from the steppes of Asia, that took out the Roman Empire. It took a long time, but eventually it um, ended the Roman Empire, and they filled in the void, and they became the ancestors to a lot of European countries. And their legacy, the days of our week, but probably more importantly is the book Beowulf, and this notion of a story, and, and these archetypes within a story that we still have today. Thank you for watching.